What's up, dude? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. I hope that you all had a great Easter. If I guess if you celebrate Easter, because I know that a lot of people that watch my channel are from Saudi Arabia. So I guess I don't know that you guys celebrate Easter, but that kind of sorry that was really awkward i don't know why i said it like that um anyway so since yesterday was easter i decided that we would do an easter crime story so strap in and let's get ready to talk about some murder james urban rupert was born march 29th 1934 his mother charity actually told them that she would have preferred that he be a girl because she wanted to have a daughter as her second child now james had an older brother named leonard jr named after their father leonard so it's just leonard jr and then james his dad had a terribly violent temper and, and had very little affection for his two sons so he had a very unhappy childhood. In 1946, Leonard passed away at 37 when his sons were 12 and 14, so they are close in age also. Leonard Jr. had to become the man of the house slash father figure for the family, and he relentlessly bullied James. Leonard Jr. would taunt him for being a weakling. When James was 16, he was so unhappy at home that he ran away and attempted to commit suicide. The suicide didn't go as planned, so he returned home and, in a lot of ways, kind of never left. So, as an adult, James was uh, 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighed only 137 pounds. So, he actually was a relatively small guy in stature. He was described as modest, bookish, and helpful. Overall, people said that he was unremarkable and quiet. Kind of just like an NPC, you know, like just someone in the background almost that isn't like gorgeous or incredibly fascinating to listen to talk. Just n not really like that. Like he was just, I mean, kind of there, you know. He had no police record. He was a good citizen. He dropped out of college after two years, then trained as a draftsman, which is an engineering technician who makes very detailed technical drawings or plans for machinery, buildings, electronics, infrastructure, sections, etc. So it, like, I mean, obviously he was a smart guy. This sounds like a very tough uh, career to go into. I think it sounds really hard. However, by 19... 75 james was unemployed unmarried and was still living at home with his mom by this point james was jealous of his older brother's successful career in family leonard jr earned an electrical engineering degree so they're both engineers of sort and married one of the few girlfriends that james had ever had so he stole his brother's girlfriend which really is not cool he also owned his own home in fairfield ohio with eight children Charity was annoyed with James because he couldn't hold down a job and he had a bit of a drinking problem, probably because he was so unhappy in life, if I'm being real. She threatened to evict him on more than one occasion, and James had invested what little cash he had, as well as some of his moms and brothers, uh, in the stock market. However, he lost it all in, 19, er, in the 1973 to 1974 stock market crash. So he also owed his mom and his brother some money. James asked about silencers for his guns while purchasing ammunition one day. This doesn't seem like a really odd thing. If you're buying ammo, you're kind of a gun person and w want to talk about guns, possibly. So this doesn't seem like a very out of the ordinary thing to talk about. Around this time, James's behavior escalated to just straight up depression. On March 29th, 1975, when James turned 41, people reported seeing him doing target practice with tin cans with his 22 pistol and 22 rifle along the Great Miami River in Hamilton. On March 29th, James went out like he typically did to the 19th Hole Cocktail Lounge and he visited with an employee, Wanda Bishop, who was 28 years old at the time. She claims that James told her that he was frustrated with his mother's demands and his impending eviction and that he needed to solve the problem according to wanda james claimed that his mom said that if he could go buy beer seven nights a week then he could afford to pay some rent which is very true now he did leave the bar and then went back around 2 a.m and she 
asked him like, oh, did you take care of the problem? And he said, not yet, but soon. On Easter Sunday, March 30th, 1975, Leonard Jr. and his wife Alma brought all eight of their kids, um, whose ages ranged from four to 17 years old. They went to Charity and James's house to celebrate Easter. Around 4 p.m., James wakes up, loads a 357 Magnum, two 22 caliber handguns, and a rifle before going downstairs. Charity was making Sloppy Joes in the kitchen as Leonard Jr. and Alma sat and visited with them. Most of the children were playing in the living room, and as James walked into the kitchen, he shot Leonard Jr. in the head and then his sister-in-law, killing them both. Charity lunged at James to try to stop him, but he unfortunately shot her once in the head and then twice in the chest. Three of Leonard Jr. and Alma's children were later killed. Then, after shooting his mom in the kitchen, James went into the living room and one by one shot the rest of his nieces and nephews. Besides Charity, the rest of the family was shot once in the head and then once again to ensure that they were in fact dead. The whole shooting took less than two minutes. But remember, he was doing target practice, so he was somewhat skilled, I guess you could say. If he was doing target practice, I mean, he couldn't have been horrible. Three hours later, James called the police and said, there's been a shooting. He patiently waited inside the front door for the cops to show up. So he really didn't, like, try to resist arrest. I mean, he did it, and he knew that he did it, and that he had messed up. Nobody in town thought that James would be capable of violence just because he was such an unremarkable person. He was arrested that day, um, the day of the shooting, and was charged with 11 counts of aggravated homicide, one count for each person. He refused to answer any questions and was very uncooperative with the police. James made sure that he knew that he would plead insanity. The prosecutor saw the crime scene and said that there was so much blood on the first floor that it was seeping through the floorboards into the basement. James fired off 35 rounds. The house was completely cleaned up and redone and then rented out to a family that didn't know the history of the house or that um, people had been murdered in it. They later moved out because they were hearing voices and like other unexpected noises. Many other families moved in and out of the home, but the house is still occupied to this day. So they did clean up the crime scene. They ripped out the carpet. They redid a bunch of stuff. So the house was redone, but you can't redo a spirit. On July 23rd, 1982, James was found guilty on two counts of first degree murder. Uh, but he wasn't found guilty on the other nine counts due to insanity. I don't know where kind of the cutoff is for just straight up murdering someone and then like, oh, they can get away with it because they were insane. I don't know like what the difference is or why sometimes it's like just murder and sometimes it's insanity. Like why those are two separate things like in a case like this. I don't fully understand, but... James was denied parole two times before his death on June 4th of 2022, so literally last year. He was 88 years old. He passed away from natural causes, I mean, he was 88, while in jail at the Franklin Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio. So, he did try getting out of jail, like, he attempted, he wanted parole but the parole board just did not feel like he was somebody that should in fact be let out and actually when they first went to trial for this case they did it in hamilton which is where the murder took place but they didn't know like the judges that were in on the case and the jury and everybody they didn't know that it had to be a unanimous decision and then they also felt so like they weren't able to come up with a unanimous vote when they when the jury and the judge were like all done and everyone had made up their mind the jury i don't know if they found him guilty or not guilty and then the judge found him guilty or not guilty but they didn't agree so they like came with their verdict and everything and then they were like you guys this is supposed to be unanimous so we can't accept your ruling now because kind of fumbled a little bit there but then also they were like we're not going to get an unbiased jury because it happened in Hamilton and it does sound like it's a small community so because of that too it's like they had to go somewhere else to do the trial and you do see this quite if quite often in true crime cases like if you are killed in a small town 
or if you do something bad in a small town chances are they're not going to try you in that same town because everyone sort of forms their opinions already and it's a small town people talk so it's just better to get an unbiased jury in a different town so that's not super surprising but that is it for today's video if you guys found this interesting please be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you want um also comment down below how you feel about this it's a pretty straightforward case not nothing too crazy but i just thought since it happened on easter it'd be an interesting one to listen to so that's it for me today thank you guys for watching and i'll be back tomorrow with another true crime courier video bye guys